close relationship where I think all art is unsurprisingly political, in the sense that everything is political, and I think it can be an amazing space for... I think what's good about it is that we have activism. You know, we have people going out there and protesting and making change, and that's what's incredibly important that needs to exist. But we also need a space where we can kind of think about things and make mistakes and be kind of fragile and sort of just ask questions. So I think they're incredibly related about being the same thing. Like I'm not deluded enough to think that my plan is going to, you know, make the government change their policies or whatever. But but I but I don't think I'm trying to achieve that. Like probably none of you are either. It, it's that sense of this is a space actually in which we don't have to be rigid. We don't have to kind of abide by all of these kind of societal rules and fiscal rules. We can just be very, very sort of open. And I think the more complicated the kind of problem, the more important that openness is, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think. And then, um, what kind of issues at the moment um, about gender are you currently thinking about? I think at the moment I'm working on something new which is quite um, interesting kind of environmental sort of issues and I think inevitably you, you come up against gender when you're thinking about that because what I find really interesting is there are so many, it's almost like a double, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand there are a lot of connections between the way that like women are treated and the way that sort of like nature or the non-women can be treated in the sense of how sort of difference can be repressed and abused. On the, on the flip side to that, I'm very aware that I don't want to fall into these kind of cliche ideas that somehow because you identify as a woman or because you have some female body parts, that means that somehow you're kind of closer to nature and all these kind of things. So I think that can be another form of kind of limitation and oppression as well. So I think it's very, very complicated to try and forge that part. But I think what's interesting is even if you don't believe that any particular characteristics like a hair any particular kind of gender, What's nice, and I think people who are interested in the occult do this a bit as well, is the idea that things which are kind of denigrated as bad, whether it's sort of like overt sexuality or kind of fragility or emotion, that you can reclaim that. And I think that does have a link to environmentalism, because I think to be able to live in a world in which kind of softness and gentleness has to be your kind of abiding rule really goes against like a kind of deeply masculine sort of like Western society. So, it's kind of, even if you're not overtly thinking, I'm going to think about gender, when you start to think about any sort of non-human environmental issues, it just keeps kind of coming back and slapping in the face. So I found that really interesting. And yeah, I still have a lot to discover and think about, but yeah, it's been fascinating. Great, and certainly lots to think about. Um, and uh, any questions from the audience? If you want to raise your hand, if you have anything to ask. That'd be fine if not, we can just get some drinks and stuff. <laughs> with Sarah Shin at the Motor Press, um, 21st Century Occult Poetry. Um, and I've always found it really fascinating for reasons quite hard to explain. But for me, like I kind of explained at the beginning what the book is vaguely about. And I kind of thought, how can I as one individual talk about something like female history? Like, because I'm just one person with one experience, that's completely ridiculous. So I needed a kind of figure that was very really porous and very kind of open, but also one who maybe had a connection to all of those denigrated female characteristics like overt sexuality, like kind of, you know, intensity and kind of emotion and all of those things. And it, it just suddenly I was like, yeah, the witch. She represents all of that. Like I went to an exhibition and there were all these representations of witches and they're all negative. But I was really overwhelmed by it because I've actually never seen so many images of female power ever in one place. It was like really kind of electric, even though they were all meant to be kind of insulting, if you know what I mean. And I just thought, wow, there's so much unused power here. 
and I don't want to <laughs> just realise that. As I got so original, I started booking them. <laughs> yeah, everyone's getting on that. But it's great. I'm excited that they are. So I think yeah, there's a there's an obvious sort of feminist power in that idea of which kind of Oh gosh, I mean, I truly don't think there's one answer to that. I like, actually wrote a massive article about this for White View, and I think what you realise is, you know, there are people who still practice with Trump in cultures in which it's not decorated and repressed. It's, it's, it's a completely normal part of life and religion. So I think I'm very wary to kind of to, to limit it, because as I say, it exists in so many different practices. I think from my perspective, aka a Western person using it as a kind of trope, rather than a kind of lived experience or whatever. For me it's the idea that someone can use language to make material change. That's what excited me about writing a form of a spell. That language is meant to go out into the world, it's meant to do something. Whether it's like make you fall in love with someone, kill them, whatever. And to say that you're writing a spell, suddenly just returns all that potency into the language and that was just really fun to play with in the book. Yeah. Anything? Thank you.